So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom Two Zero Live today. It's Saturday, June the eighth, two thousand thirteen. Our topic today is featured teacher, and our special guest today is Holly Clark. Those of you may be new to our session. I think we have some new folks. I just want to give you a heads up uh, to you and anyone new to the recordings. We do have a great way to aggregate all the resources that are sh shared in several ways, one of them being our live binder for Classroom 20. And Peggy will probably be typing the link in the chat. If you don't get it this time, it, throughout the session, she will be uh, posting the link. And it's a great resource because everything that's happening today gets uh, posted in the live binder. As well, if there are resources shared by you during the session that are a complement to the show, they will also be posted in the live binder. And that's one way we share the resources. Our second is our website, live.classroom20.com. And we always point you to the archives and resources page. It's rich with resources. It's a, you'll find the actual link to today's Blackboard Collaborate recording. You'll find an MP3 file, an embedded video file. Uh, as well as the complete chat log. So if, again, it's going by too quickly and you miss something, you can go back to our blog portion of the website and grab the, any of the information there in the chat, as well as comments that are shared. And again, the links that are posted in the live binder are also posted in the blog spot, in the blog post, excuse me. Here's where we're going to ask you to get working. Now, on the left-hand side of your whiteboard is those tools. Second one down is a little starburst. So if you could just click on that for us and plant yourself in the middle of the world. And we get a good sense of where our audience is. And we have a large audience today. So welcome, everybody. It's great that you're with us today. Quite a few people in North America. And I think there's a few people on the other side of the continent one in Thailand who hasn't typed in his little icon. He usually is quite funny. Chris manages to alert us to his location. So. But we're not sure. Are you on the iPad? Those people on the iPad aren't able to actually do it. So yes. Isn't that great to see where we're all from today? Thanks. So I'm moving on to uh, the poll question section of our uh, show today. You remember just under your name on the right hand side are the voting options. So our first question today is, does your school have a formal digital student for portfolio program? Does your school have a formal digital student portfolio program? So it's a green check yes or red X no. I'll just wait for people to vote. So people are just coming in to vote. I think most people have voted here. So I'm going to publish the results to the board here. And, and a large people don't have this type of program. So it's interesting news for you, Holly, to, to take in as we go forward to, during your session today. So I'm just going to clear the votes and go to our second poll question, which is, do you have a one-to-one -one environment in your classroom? So again, green check if you do and red X if you don't. Those people on their mobile devices, yes, the bottom of your screen is idle check mark. You should be able to activate that and vote. While you're voting, I just want to send a shout out to Tammy Moore in, our, in the session today. We all remember her great presentation from last week, and uh, she's back providing us with closed captioning again. And we thank you very much for doing that service safely every Saturday, Tammy. And our uh, backup. Uh, moderator Lori Moffitt uh, has another uh, function that she's involved with right now, but she hopes to join us near the end of the session. So let's take a look at those results. Now we have a different split. Still, um, more people do not have the environment than do 40% to 27%. So let's go to our third poll question, which is, do you have students digitize their work? These are all questions to help uh, Holly get a sense of the uh, participants today and what they're able, to, what they are currently doing. I'm still waiting for the votes to come in here. I 
Okay, let's quickly take a look. The results. Now, more people are actually digitizing uh, in a different way than uh, our first questions asked. So. Thanks very much, everyone, for participating in today's voting session and the poll questions. It's my opportunity to introduce Holly to you and to begin our session today. And uh, Holly has some uh, great background and experiences that uh, I want to share with you. Currently, she's a technology administrator from San Diego, California. She helps teachers innovate instruction in their classrooms. She's a Google certified teacher a Q rock star and a national board certified teacher and she received her MA in technology and education from Columbia University has been working in technology integration in one-on-one -on -one environments since 2003. Her background includes teaching positions throughout the nation including San Francisco, Washington, Chicago and Prince presently in San Diego. This diversity of teaching positions have given her a great wealth of knowledge to draw from when thinking of ways to innovate curriculum and educate 21st century learners. As the technology curriculum specialist in River Forest, Illinois, she worked extensively with technology integration across the curriculum and now specializes in one-to-one -one iPad integration, media literacy, social networking, and Web 2.0 and 3.0 tools, and her passion about transforming schools and re redefining how teachers deliver instruction in the 21st century is contagious and she works hard to inspire others to rank, rethink your education. Tremendous uh, resources and background, Holly, to share with us today. I know we're all looking forward to an excellent presentation. So welcome, or thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. The microphone's yours. Okay, can you, okay, thank you. Can you hear me? That's, your, your audio is great. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I want to say that I am completely humbled by some of the people in this room. I've learned from Kathy Cassidy from Canada. She does a great job with digital portfolios. So there are people in this room who can answer in the chat things I probably can't answer. Um, people like Tom Decord who runs EdTech Teacher is here and I've learned so much from his iPad summits. Um, one coming up in Boston in November and so I am, at first I wasn't nervous and then I saw all these amazing people and now I, I, have a, a, I got a little nervous. Anyway, so I guess I changed the slides up here. Okay, so um, it, am I right to say that I answered this question, my newbie yes, question? Yes, it's my fault. I forgot. I, I should okay. have prompted you with the questions. So please go ahead and answer the newbie question. Okay, so my newbie question is uh, what does 2.0 mean to you? And um, I wrote a little blog post about it trying to get ready for this uh, session. And really, I don't think we're in Web 2.0 anymore. I think we're in Web 3.0 because um, I think the web is interactive and collaborative now. And with people like Paula who are doing things like Mystery Skypes, which have redefined the way we deliver instruction at my school, um, kids are interacting at a level they've never interacted with before. And they are literally coming to school. And it reminds me of the Target commercial where kids are going, open, open, open. They want to be at school because we are doing projects like Mystery Skypes and doing Skype projects with other schools and teaching Canadians about US history. And Canadians are teaching us about their history. And the, the classroom is able to be redefined through these Web 3.0 tools, I like to call them. I can remember when it was Web 1.0 and Amazon came out. And I remember thinking, wow, I can buy stuff online. But nothing was interactive at that point. And pretty soon you could do um, reviews. And I was reading what people thought about books. And that's when it became Web 2.0. And now it's something completely different. And I wish I were a student in 2013. My life would have been changed. Um, OK, so let's get started with um, student digital portfolios. Like I said, I am honored by some of the names in this room who can tell you more than I can probably, but we're all smarter because of each other and they're part of my PLN. So um, let's see, I keep trying to use my own arrow. So uh, I have this video I like to start with, but this particular Blackboard Collaborate doesn't make it easy for you to show video. So I'm just going to tell you about this video. This is kind of a funny video put on by Onion Magazine or The Onion. And it's about people going and taking a tour of what Blockbuster look, used to look like. And Blockbuster, can you believe that people traveled for like six miles to get a video and then you weren't sure if the video was there and there was this whole feeling of not knowing and this, 
it's this time and they have a guy come on who worked there for like one year and he shows everyone around. And I think Blockbuster is the perfect example for what we're doing in education. We don't want to be the Blockbuster, the people who didn't move on when we needed to. So now Blockbuster, I don't know if there are any left, actually. I know there are red boxes at my supermarket and I laugh when people are sitting there at the red box because I think, what are you doing? Why, aren't you, why don't you have an Apple TV? And why aren't you streaming your video or, or doing on demand? But, um, so this video always puts in reference for me that I don't want to be that kind of educator. I don't want to be the educator who didn't keep up with the times, the newspaper who's trying to still send out newspapers. And um, let me go to the next, sorry. And I think that that's what we're doing with testing. Here's a student taking a test. He hates it. We hate it as teachers. We expect that everyone's going to be able to give us the same information on the same time. And what are we really learning from this testing environment? So um, I started to think about it. And I thought it's a, really about the reflection. The metacognition comes from the reflection piece. So oops, let me go back. So I saw this comic. And it really, really says <laughs> what's going on in school. What, if you look at it, they're asking what skills you have, and the kid's saying, I can take tests. Is that the kind of student that we want to produce? Um, are we expecting all our students to come up with the same time, this, I mean, at the same time, the same information and be able to give us information that will tell us about them as a learner? Um, uh, doing these slides is hard for me. So I remember back in the day, I don't want to date myself, but I had these digital portfolios. Someone brought in a crate of this portfolios from last year. I taught eighth grade at the time. And they were the seventh grade work. And I had to keep adding to these digital portfolios, which I did because I was a new teacher and I did what I was told. And so my kids put in their English and their history work and we commented on it. And then I gave it to them in eighth grade. They were going to go to high school. And the first place and the first thing they did with these digital portfolios is throw them in the trash. They never did anything with that information. Nobody cared. It was a big pain for me to try and pull out from them this reflection piece. But that was a different age. That was 1997 for me. And we didn't have computers the way we do now. It's different. And we have to be blockbuster. And we have to change the way we do things. So here are some students at my school who have iPads, one-to-one -one iPads this year. And it really made me think about, all of the digital work that they're producing, where is that going? What's happening to that? So we have to really do these digital student portfolios for the students. Here they are making this work. And we have to have it go on with them. So here's an example of three kids. They've done, they've each read a different book in a literature circle. They've each, one's made an iMovie, one's done an Explain Everything. And this was done by a really good teacher at my school, Shelley Moses. And, um, she had them make these digital products. Now, kids are turning in their iPads this year, and they're going to be housed for the summer. Where is that information? Who saw that? Did the parents even get to see it? So we need to put it somewhere, somewhere where they can showcase their work. But the important part really is about digital student portfolios also equal understanding about digital citizenship. So, oh, I have these come in at different times in my presentation, but I'll, if you'll just look at the pictures, you'll, you'll get to see what I mean. The first one, we're talking about digital citizenship that they're learning. Kids need to understand that what they make and they place online is not private. And having digital student portfolios lets them get a glimpse into that. As soon as they put something in a portfolio, it's no longer something that is just theirs. And when they create something, they need to understand that. When they put something online, they need to understand that. It's creating their digital footprints. And they're building the next picture with the uh, questions, they're building their digital web presence. And they will start to grasp this understanding as they put work online. We don't want kids putting just anything online on their Facebook, on their Twitter, on their, oh gosh, don't get me started on Instagram. Um, and that's what's happening. And if we show them that what they put online, they can make their own digital presence. 
everything they post builds this presence and um, either other people are going to build it by posting stuff about them or they can strategically populate their own information and how the world views them. They also need to learn how to curate their own work and that's an important concept in 2013. Once they create good stuff, how do they curate it, pick the best stuff? What about the questions? What about putting stuff online that is not your best work? As they work through this process, um, they can begin to see that it's the importance, really, of the digital presence and the digital footprint. It basically, it comes down to building your own personal brand, and they need to understand that from as early as kindergarten, if you ask me. And then the last one is this idea of presenting this information. They're growing up in a society where they, cure, where they create and share. That's what they want to do. They don't want to just hand in a worksheet. And when they're sharing this, they have to get people to come to their work. And they're not going to do that if they're creating presentations that are black background with their names coming in, bling, 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 bling. You know, you've seen it on um, PowerPoint when it's spinning in. They have to learn the design process. We have to teach them from a, a young age that friends don't let friends use word art. We have to teach them that, um, that they have to think about keeping it simple, stupid, and make their uh, presentation style something people will want to stay and read. I have a, there's a particular person that I follow in my PLN who I think is the best writer and I think he has the best stuff, but on the back of his blog is a bunch of like word art, I think it's a wordle actually, I'm not even sure, and it, it distracts me from reading what he posted. And so I want to teach my kids to not have those distractions around the things that they present. Um, so that's why digital student portfolios can help open the door to understanding digital citizenship. Next, the kids need to know that their digital footprint is going to be what people use to get them into college, to hire them. There isn't anybody who really anymore doesn't Google a job applicant who's one of the final three. Um, they need to understand what they put out there will be part of what other people understand about them. And at this point in their life, they are building their digital legacy, plain and simple. And we've got to help them curate their information and put up the right information and build their own personal web presence. And this does it for them. Um, sorry. So. Through this process, they understand that they are global learners and that what they contribute is part of a global knowledge base. But it's what I always tell kids when they're making blogs. No one's going to come to your blog. No one's going to come to your portfolio if it is not designed correctly. You have to have a title for your blog that gets people to want to read it. If you put assignment number one, no one's going to read your blog post. So why even put it up? Same with this digital work. And as we curate and digitize work, students start to realize the value of what brings people to that work. Then they can start to look at the analytics, which I find, I, I love looking at the analytics of my personal blog, <laughs> but um, that's always fun to have kids think about. So then we have this byproduct of digitizing student work. Teachers have to think about their lessons. Is my lesson good enough to be digitized? Or is this worksheet really something I want to go up online for parents to see? So we get this kind of added bonus. And if teachers know that students are going to digitize their work, let's say, once a unit, they might actually come up with a, what I like to call a rock star unit that will be worth digitizing. And one other thing is, is maybe we take the work off the teachers. Instead of us grading it, the kids are reflecting on this information before they digitize it. This, is, this to me, is one of the biggest impacts. Just like iPads have been a huge impact in my, um, in, with my teachers because they're now saying, huh, how do I redefine my instruction? It's being kind of forced on them, and they're doing a fantastic job because it's, it's there and it's right in front of them. The kids are all looking at them like, what? Why are we doing worksheets still? So um, I, I really can't show videos, but I want to talk to you about these two examples, and I'll try and walk you through them. In California, 
we do a California missions project. <laughs> and if any of you are Californians in fourth grade, you did this great mission project. And here is a video that I usually show where a parent built a mission. Let's be honest, it wasn't the kid. And the kid takes a video camera and he goes around the whole mission, never saying one word about the mission, never saying what's inside, what happened at the mission, what they were built for. And he does this whole video and it has some great background music. It's actually a really awesome mission. You can tell by looking at this picture. But there is no learning happening whatsoever. If we look at this next digital example, and I can't show you the video, but this is a Minecraft video. And this, um, this presentation link is up online. If you can watch this video, it will blow your mind and give you chills all over your body because this kid has made a Minecraft video about what a California mission looks like. And the whole way through, you walk in, and he narrates exactly what this is for. The missionary slept here. They ate here. Here's what they did. It is, I, I mean, I cannot believe a fourth grader did this. And these are the examples of where we were and where we are now. And a kid can't make a video like this and not digitize it, not show the college uh, ed people who are letting him in something amazing like this. It is mind blowing. So try and go back and watch this later. Oh, it's also on um, one of my friend David Malone's um, websites. He's EdTech Horizons. I'm going to be showing a couple things of his. Um, you can go there, and it's um, on his website. Uh, OK, so there's three types of portfolios. There's the process, and that takes a look at um, the steps you took. The showcase, which is kind of what I'm leaning towards. And then there's a hybrid that does both. But I kind of like the idea of the showcase because it really shows kids that they're building their digital portfolio. They populate it. Why let someone else populate your digital web presence? You should do it. So um, oh, thanks, Peggy, for putting that up. Um, uh, so next. So the process is really easy. I don't know if you have Google Apps for Education at your school, but if you don't, stop everything, write something up, in September walk in and hand in the sheet to your IT, which I know can be difficult, um, and say, we need Google Apps for Education, because this tool and the iPad together are revolutionizing the classroom. I have never seen anything like it. So with Google Apps for Education, I've been able to do these portfolios. The kids, and I'm going to walk through this process in a second, but they use Drive to house their information. They use forms to reflect on it, and they use sites to um, publish their work. And um, OK, so here is a, one of my students digitizing work. We're taking a, a, a worksheet, which I won't say that's good or bad in this situation, because that worksheet is now being redefined. The student goes on to explain everything and shows and digitizes and visualizes their learning. So the teacher really sees the process of it. They can share that video with another kid. That's a whole other offshoot of it. But here we are digitizing the work. Now, I, I don't know what happened at the bottom of this presentation. I usually have where these come from, and I'm not sure why they're not showing up or what I did wrong. But this, actually, I just found on the web. It comes from some great teacher who may even be in this room. And the, this is a. Um, uh, a school, obviously, when they do a product, they say, now you can um, finish that, you know, after reading a book or whatever, you can do a product. And here are 12 examples of things you can do. In my school, I wouldn't let them do that until I taught them how to do it effectively, because I want a kid who makes a digital story to do it correctly. But um, once they're there, they can uh, respond with one of these 12 ways. And that's what can be digitized. Now here, David Malone, he's up at the top left-hand corner if you want to see his name. He starts by having kids, and this is mind-blowing to me. They start out first grade, or maybe whatever grade, and they read from a book. So he puts a book on Explain Everything. And then the kids record, and you'll see in this next, they have a little um, red dot that records what they're reading so that the, they can have where they were at the beginning of the school year and where they are at the end. That is showing growth like no multiple choice test ever can. I don't know why we haven't ditched multiple choice tests. And if you do the research on multiple choice tests and where they came from, it's amazing that we have them. But um, to show growth like this to a parent, 
at the beginning and then again at the end of the school year, there's nothing more helpful and more enlightening than doing something in this manner. And you could do this in high school. This isn't just fourth grade or, or preschool. And um, if you want to see more about this, what it's called at the top, you can see iPad Literacy Project. Again, at Tech Horizons, he does a great job of explaining it. Mind blowing. We're doing it at our school next year. And I think this could even, I think this is from Kern Kelly. I want to put a shout out to Kern Kelly. Um, he also does digital student portfolios, I believe, in Maine. And he's a Google certified teacher. Um, here is a preschooler. They're going to read a book with a teacher. And you can see the little girl in the um, orange. She is a fifth grade student. She's on some tech team. I believe he calls them tech Sherpas, but at my school, they're their student, um, their Apple geniuses, they come into the room and help the teacher digitize his work. This kid's going to read a book. He's going to, um, uh, she's going to film it, and we're going to have this example from the start to the finish of the year. I mean, seriously mind blowing. Okay, now after you've digitized the work, and you can do it in, a, in any manner, there is the reflection process. What did the kid do? Why are they? Why do they want to digitize this? Why do they want this part of their portfolio? And you can do this with a simple Google form. Again, if you're not using Google Apps for Education, we like to call it GAF or GAF. Please, you need it. Um, and they can do their reflection process there. They turn in the assignment. Next, they could also, if you're not a Google Apps for Education school and you're an iPad one-to-one -one school or or cart, whatever. There's notability. This kid with the Minecraft video could have written something like this. I actually wrote this as an example of what could be, but um, the mission project was my favorite because blah, blah, blah. And they can have that go into their digital portfolio. So we've digitized. Now it's time to upload. Where do we house this information? Here's the workflow that's really important. So we're uploading to Google Drive, and all iPad products can go on to Google Drive from iMovie, Explain Everything, Notability, a podcast, Toontastic. They can all be housed in Google Drive. Now, my teachers are kind of a little bit confused at Google Drive. They think that now they can show it as if it's a YouTube video, and I'm working with them to understand that this is just a place to house it at this point. I could change. But if you want to have it so people can see it, it's better if you make it a YouTube or Vimeo channel. Um, and I give them a demonstration video on how to upload to um, Google Drive. It's one minute. If you need something like that, you can download this presentation that's there. And now it's time to publish. Where do you publish? We need them to be creators, contributors, curators. Here comes that process. So I don't know if you know that um, there is review. Review is a digital resume. I can see that kids are probably going to be doing digital resumes of some sort. Um, this is the adult version. I'm sure there will be kid versions soon. But if you haven't gone to review, I suggest you check it out. It's really mind-blowing what people are doing with resumes now. And that's what we need to get our kids ready for. So. As they're publishing, I wanted to show you this example. This is 2003. Listen, I did this too. But we do not want these text-heavy, green background, uh, what is that, uh, yellow font. I, I don't even want to read this because it's kind of too much there. We want it to be more simple. So here's an example of what we do in my school. Um, I made a template. I have, you know, few for them to choose from. Here's a fourth grade student. She's got her third grade work. She's got her showcase. She's got her subject. So you can see in science I did this, in math I did this. She's got her reflection area. But more importantly, if you look on the right hand side, she's got this learning profile. Who is she as a learner in fourth grade? What are her learning goals? We can keep going back to those. What are her accomplishments? Now this is a good one because the kid has to think, what am I going to put in that accomplishment area? So when something comes up, like maybe volunteering in the garden or going out and helping an animal center, she thinks, oh, i got to put something in my accomplishments. So she volunteers for this. So it keeps them thinking. And next year, she's going to have fourth grade as a tab. The next year, she's going to have fifth grade as a tab. Maybe then it will become lower school or elementary school. And she has a portfolio of her work. I would love to see what I produced in fourth grade. I have no idea 
quite frankly, what I did. It, anyway, I think we all have that. Um, here's an example, and I have to apologize. The example is not there uh, of where this comes from, and uh, I'm horrified because I'm really into making sure that that is up there. But um, so for a kid who is doing um, a digital port, I mean a dance session, and they're young and they can't fill it out, here's someone who said, "What did we do? What did we learn? Uh, what do we do next?" This could even be from Kathy. Who knows? Um, and this is easy, and it shows parents, why did we do this little dance festival? It helps everyone in the community get an understanding of what education is in that classroom. So I, this idea comes again from Kern Kelly. We're all smarter because we know each other in our personal learning networks. He has this idea that he gives out to um, uh, kids their domain names for graduation. So let's say you have 100 kids in um, the 12th grade class and they've made these portfolios. Now you put them up and you put hollyclark.info. And what's great about that is they have this, their, do, their name and a domain name, but the .infos go on sale for 99 cents once a year or maybe even twice a year. So buying those for your school as a graduation gift is easy. And they give it to them for a year, and if they want to continue to um, have that, they have that option. And I think that's fantastic. I have a friend, Tanya Avers, who um, she her kids are two and five, and she already has their personal domain name spot. She takes photos from them and puts them onto their uh, email address associated with that domain name. They already have a digital portfolio, and the kid is two years old. And they already have their domain name. I, you know, gives me shivers. I think it's fantastic. Um, I talked through this presentation pretty quickly, <laughs> so I'm going to slow down for a second because I'm almost done. Um, uh, so, if you're going to do this, I think this needs to be every educator's goal in the 2013-2014 school year. To not have digital portfolios is I want to say criminal, but I won't. Um, and you've got to start small. You've got to gather everything that you can into Google Drive. And from there, kids have the ability to decide what's going to go up. Um, they have to make a goal to do one project, a grading period. And that goal is also going to make the teachers think about the projects that they are, they're doing. The students need to reflect on these using Google Forms. They need to publish using Google Sites. Oh, I want to talk about that really quick. So with the lower kids, I have them on Google Sites right now. But I think um, if I were doing it again, I might do like a Weebly for the kids in the younger grades. And as they get older, ninth and 10th, middle school, ninth, 10th, uh, it'd be more Google Sites. And then um, as they're in 11th and 12th grade, let them choose. Now let them be creative. If you read. Um, Ed Leadership Magazine a couple months ago about creativity. Creativity isn't just saying to a kid, hey, go do that. Go on Microsoft Word and just do anything you want. You have to teach them the design principles and the basics and then let them get creative. But don't just say, okay, make digital portfolios. I was in a session the other day in Huntington Beach and this person was showing um, digital portfolios and they, and they were what I was talking about earlier in the session. They were black backgrounds and they were um, pink font and the person, they were really proud and they were doing great stuff, but no one would really want to look at that portfolio. So we do have to remember that, that part. Um, hi, Michelle, by the way, I saw you in here from Canada. A lot of Canadian educators in here today. Um, and so, I talked my way through this. Usually it takes me an hour, but I think with all these great people in here, I talked uh, way too quick. Um, so uh, I would like to first see if there are any questions that I can answer. And I'd also like some people who are in here, like Kathy Cassidy, who can talk about digital portfolios even more than I can, to maybe take the mic over. So th are there any questions? I did see one question. It was. If your tech director is anti-Google, do you have a few other options? Ah, the old IT director is anti-Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
anyone who knows me knows I'm laughing very hard right now because I have a person fighting me tooth and nail at my school over Google Apps for Education. Um, hmm. I, first thing I would say to do about something like that is to write up a uh, rationale and some things about Google Apps for Education that might convince your IT and also tell them they'll be saving money. I think it's um, for a school about a thousand people and under, it can be as much as $35,000. I, I think I have that information wrong as, as I'm saying it, it sounds too much, but they can save money. But if you are not for Google, they are not going to bring that in, then get your own Gmail accounts. But here's what I did when I first got my own Gmail accounts. I let the kids have just their own one, that their personal one. And it got too confusing to know that hot soccer player, 53, was really my student, Jose. And so um, I actually made them all sign up, and I had parents sign up sign a permission slip, and I gave them all the same naming structure. So Jose was Jose S. at CVMS, which was Carmel Valley Middle School. And um, we all kind of made our GAFE accounts before my school came on board. And that's something that you can do. Um, GAFE just uh, makes it easier to push out information and to do things like that. But if you have them have their own Google accounts and they know that the guy next to me is, um, and they don't, so let's say they don't know each other that well, he's John M. He, you know his naming structure is John M. CVMS at gmail.com, and they can easily email each other that way, so it, it takes care of that problem. Oh, we'll have Wes Fryer. Hi. These people know all about digital student portfolios. I wish they could all take over the mic and say one or two things. Um, are there any, oh, it, so if someone just put up the Chad Kafka, okay, there's another Google certified teacher. These people are amazing. People are doing amazing stuff with digital student portfolios. Um, any other questions? Oh, sorry, I ended kind of early. No, I can no, no. Talk about it though. We love to be able to take questions and uh, have people share. So if you like, you can continue typing your questions in the chat, or we can give you the mic. And there's a question about um, teachers are close to the blockbuster stage in their community from Lisa. Mm -hmm. And how can she start by sharing the importance to educate the entire community? Um, can you say that again? Lisa Dennison in the chat asked that mm -hmm. teachers are close to the blockbuster stage. And how can mm -hmm. she uh, start the conversations and emphasizing the importance of educating the entire community on using portfolios and becoming more of a digital um, person. Okay. So this is one of my um, big, big things. I, uh, I must have been three or four years ago I wanted to get my kids on Twitter. I'm going to use Twitter as an example. I never once went to my administration. I kind of did, I, whatever. But what I did instead is when parents came to me at back to school night, I gave them a whole digital citizenship um, presentation. I didn't even talk about what I'm going to do in the classroom. I gave them like two seconds on that. And then I said, this is what we have to prepare your kids for. Either I can do it or they're going to go out and do it on their own. They're not really going to talk to you about it. So I want to take this time in my language English class and teach them about Twitter. And here's how we're going to do it. Here's how it's safe. Here's how I'm going to make sure it's safe. And I'm going to make sure that you have their name and you can follow them if you want. And if anything goes wrong, I'm going to let you know. And I let parents know from the get-go how it is that this is important. When we got iPads at my school last year, parents were not happy. The thing that they kept coming into my office, well, when are they going to do cursive? How are they going to be learning how to write? So I said, okay, stop. And I put together four information, parent information sessions, and I had the parents come in and I talked to them about 21st century learning. I gave them a whole presentation just on 21st century learning. Then I talked to them about social media because they don't even know about it, quite frankly. They're on Facebook, kind of. They don't understand what Instagram and Snapchat, don't get me started on Snapchat either, um, what, we're, what, what is out there for the kids and how they are using it. So once I did that, 
I turned people who were like about ready to leave my school because it's an independent school because we were using iPads. I turned them around. Now they are my biggest allies. And I can change education from the community up. I can't do it without the community because parents don't understand mm, connectedness the way we do because we have a PLN and the way kids kind of do. And so you got to get the parents in there. You got to start and you got to have webinars for parents. You can't do this alone because what they're going to say about digital student portfolios, I don't want my kids stuff online. And I see um, some people even do this whole avatar thing. And I think um, actually Kern Kelly, who I admire and I am in awe of, I think he does avatars until like eighth grade and then maybe they get their own name. I really work to have parents let the kids have their name online from fourth grade on because they have to understand this. The other day I walked into the fourth grade room and asked the kids, how many of you are on Instagram? And I thought maybe like one or two. 95% uh, said, yes, we're on Instagram. Can we get on your Instagram, Ms. Clark? And I said, oh, we have no idea what's coming up. We have to prepare these kids. So that's how, long, long answer. <laughs> but we have to start with the community. If you're not having parent information sessions, you've got to start September or August whatever it is for your school. And have them yourself. I didn't ask administrators if we could have them. I brought people into my classroom and I offered them. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> yes, several have gone by. Um, somebody asked if Google Hangouts can be private or do they have to be recorded in public? Oh yeah, okay, that's easy. First of all, Google Hangouts, I couldn't live without them. And I mean literally, but they can be private. They don't have to be um, public. You can live broadcast them. And right now on Google Plus, it kind of takes you automatically for some reason to that live broadcasting one. Um, if you go in a different way from your um, Gmail account, you can get to one that's private much more easily. And um, I, my kids with iPads, they don't really um, get help from people one-to-one -one anymore. They FaceTime each other. They will FaceTime each other from one side of the room to the other and ask a question. And if that's what makes their boat float, let them do it because they're getting help. But um, Google Hangouts are an amazing way to collaborate with kids outside of school. And oh, Kyle must be in here. Hi, Kyle. Um, uh, there you are. Hi. Uh, it's an amazing way for kids to collaborate with you outside of class and for them to collaborate with each other. The only problem is, is Google is really, really tight on the 13 and over Google Hangout rule. And I'm not willing to break that because they've said, like, we'll take away your Gates account. And um, I, I don't want to do that. But any kind of video conferencing that kids can do with each other is so powerful. Okay. And Anything else? Well, um, were you referring to, I was answering a question in the chat oh. about they can take away your GAFE account? They can't. Well, they say that in their, um, their like, disclaimer. If you turn on, because you can turn on in the dashboard certain parts of the Google Apps for Education um, things. And they, when you go to turn on Google Hangouts for the kids, it is a big, huge warning. No kids under 13 should be using this. And um, oh, oh, that's what I'm okay. talking about. But my okay, kids yeah. are all on it anyway. And that so. applies mainly to the United States, the 13 and under. But every state um, and um, every yeah. country has their own laws and, and rules regarding um, so I work really closely with Canadians. I probably work closer with Canadians than I do with people in the United States. And um, they have the same thing. Exact. Okay. I can't talk for UK, but yeah. Um, is Kathy still here? Yes, she is, and we'd love to hear from her in yes. just a second. Yes, would you, no would you share would you have anything a I didn't? A question. I'm sorry. You're on an, um, a tablet, so it's going to oh, be Kathy difficult. Is? Uh, no, Noah is who raised her hand yeah. to ask a question. 
um, I can try and give you the mic, but I don't think it's going to work since you're on a tablet. Okay, they're away, so let me go ahead. And... Well, Kathy has the mic right now, so can we come back and let... Um, and Absolutely. Can... Go right ahead, Kathy. Um, so I don't... You know what? I think that Holly's doing a great job. I'm really not familiar at all with, with the Google products, and, and I haven't used them with my young children, so, so I've learned a lot from her. Um, <laughs> I don't use... Um, Google products with my six and seven year olds. Um, I use a blog as their digital portfolio and one of the things I like about that is that it's dated so that, that you can see the progress from the first week of school when we do our first post. You can see their progress through the year and in grade one that's especially dramatic because at, when they come to me they really cannot write anything that's readable and I have to put in brackets what they meant for it to say. And then as the year progresses, you can see their writing improving. And now that we have iPads and have access to so many more ways to demonstrate our learning, we, we post artifacts for all of our subject areas for math. We do podcasts of our reading fluency, as you mentioned. We, um, we do um, projects at the end of a social studies or a science unit to show what we've learned in that. Um, and so we use a blog portfolio as a portfolio. Um, I particularly, in, in particular, I'm using EduBlogs as our platform, and I really like that. I know another good one for young ch children is KidBlog, and I put earlier in the, in the chat, I put a link to um, my blog and, and one that, from grade one that's using KidBlog as a portfolio. So um, that's what I use. And I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. Um, I can answer them in the chat or I can talk about them. Great. Thank you. Because we did a session on kid blogs and it's really a, a very useful blogging platform. And Holly, what blogging platform do you use with your students? Blogger? Um, I, I was in that um, session and I use kid blog. And I use okay. it on the iPads. Great, great, because that was another question that people were wondering what you used with your students. And somebody asked for some recommendations for web design books and websites. Um, well, I am a big fan of Presentation Zen. And Presentation Zen has a website. They have um, books, and they talk about um, how when you're, let's say, doing, I, I'm not, don't tell anyone I said this word, but a PowerPoint, um, that <laughs> letters uh, come into your brain the same way one picture does. So if you have a picture, that's one message coming into your brain, but a letter, let's say you have a word of 16 letters, that's 16 messages coming into your brain. And you can't remember that the same way you can process just a picture. So. As we've all known forever, a picture is worth a thousand words. And like, I don't let kids personally, and I don't know if this answers the question, but I don't let them um, uh, do any, hardly any text. They, my fourth graders right now are doing TED Talks on iPads in the classroom and how they have changed the education. And their TED Talks have to have pictures going off in the background, but they can have no words. Um, and I think that was totally off in the presentation thing. But the Haiku also, Haiku uh, Deck, I believe it's called, for iPads is another fantastic way to teach kids presentation design because it doesn't give them the option. I say this when I'm telling kids about presentation literacies, I call it. I, um, I say, uh, I call it the Microsoft effect. Just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it. Microsoft has a lot of bells and whistles. And don't think because they're there, they need to be used. And my whole friends don't let friends use word art. And um, that's why I, again, love Google Apps for Education, because they've taken out some of those bells and whistles. In fact, they've put in too many, in my, in my opinion. But keep it simple, stupid. Oh, nice. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, Haiku Deck yeah, is awesome. awesome. Haiku deck is great um, because it does focus on the imagery versus filling 
um, every the slides up completely with text. And VoiceThread is a good example to use as well, uh, since you have your slides just images um, yeah. for the most yeah. part. Instead I like VoiceThread a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very easy for students and teachers to start out with. Um, so that would be one way to get your students and your teachers into using technology in a very easy way. And what did you use to create your word cloud? Was it Tuxedo? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, mm -hmm. They have a footprint one. Yeah. Okay. And Michelle, yeah, it kind of is a state of mind, a different approach to thinking, a different approach to content. And presentations then, um, Started with uh, Kawasaki. What's his? I can't remember the gentleman's yeah, name. Yeah, something Guy like Kawasaki. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. Um, uh, and he does a lot of things <laughs> about having only like ten slides and mainly pictures, very few bullets, and focusing on the imagery and letting your conversation and your presentation, your speaking, be the text. Whereas your your slides are a supplement to what you're talking about, so it's, it is kind of a a paradigm shift in the way you approach things. So I don't um, mean to self promote or anything, but I have on my blog, which is hollyclark.net, I have two um, posts. Well, one called "Friends Don't Let Friends Use Word Art." I I actually have a T-shirt <laughs> that I wear because I'm so want to get the message out. Um, and that friends don't let friends use word art has some information on those creation or presentation literacies that I like to go over with with teachers. And I also have one called um, 10 Reflections of an iPad Pilot where I talk about um, the student portfolio a little bit in it. Um, and also like some of the great work Tom DeCord and the EdTech teachers doing to like help people with the one-to-one -one iPads because as we're getting them, this is when it becomes important that we're doing it correctly and that we are digitizing the work correctly. Um, and people have mentioned brain rules and John Medina, John Medina's books and videos are a great way for um, just Ooh, beginning yeah. to start thinking about the way the brain processes things visually and um, teaching to the kids best learning styles and most students are visual learners versus auditory learners and um, you know taking that into consideration the digital and the technology really meets a lot of their needs because it's also kinesthetic when they're moving and typing and recording um, to meet a lot of their learning needs mm -hmm. and tap the different portions mm -hmm. of their brain, especially the creativity portion versus just sitting back as a passive recipient and or participant in a lecture. So those are great resources as well, the John Medina resources. One other thing that's a really good idea for any of you who have one-to-one -one iPads, um, uh, another ed tech teacher, um, I shout out to Kern Kelly now, and ed tech teacher are <laughs> plentiful, but um, Justin Reich, I think his name, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, he does a whole one screen movement, and I love this idea. I talk a lot about this, about that teachers should have just one screen of apps that kids are using and that they're using, so they're not, number one, overwhelmed, and so that kids can learn those apps and get good at creating inside of that one screen of apps. Like, we all get the, um, we all get the, uh, the iPad and we're like, yeah, we'll use this app and that app and that and just stick with one screen and you'll get better results. Definitely. And there was a question about what would be kind of the best profile or digital portfolio um, platform or way to create them for 11th and 12th graders. I suggested live binders because DMANT does a lot of great things yeah. with live binders. Um, what are your other suggestions? Okay, so um, <laughs> there's this great educator named David Terrio, um, and he does with his kids WordPress, which I love that idea mm -hmm, because yeah. we all use WordPress, and that's what they're going to use as adults. The kids mm -hmm. at 11th and 12th grade, they love Tumblr. 
So you know what? If they love Tumblr, I'm going to teach them how to use it correctly. So those are my two that I say for 11th and 12th grade. Oh my and gosh, Tumblr was just bought by Yahoo, and one of the uh, CEOs or the executives said that even though we bought it, they said their goal their goal is not to screw it up and to kind of keep things as they are, just to make it better. So uh, Tumblr is T U M B L R, and it's very very easy um, to upload and use and you can do things directly from your cell phone if you're allowed to use cell phones. Um, so if you're out on a field trip, if you're not even being allowed, allowed kids I'm sorry. will do it. It's not even about being That's allowed true. anymore. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yes, yeah, especially if they're not at school. They can just easily upload using your cell phone. Um, you can also record and do things from your cell phone with WordPress and on your iPad and those yeah. kinds of things. But there are a lot of blogging platforms that you can use with your cell phone and just upload in seconds. So that's another way that you could get your teachers involved. And once you get and it starts at the top. Once you get your teachers involved, then it scrolls down to your students. Or once you get your students really involved and excited. That will pass on to the teachers, and the teachers can learn from the students. Um, yep. So it kind of it can work both ways in that direction. And Kyle Pace has joined us, and he's great on using technology as well as Wes and uh, a yep. lot of people in here on using the blogging platforms and and big promoters and mentoring teachers using technology. Kyle is and we welcome anybody research. in here to jump into yeah. this conversation, please. But I'm going to go ahead and close out this show. But we understand that you may need to go, and we will continue recording. But um, when we will switch it back to Holly, and we hope that um, you'll continue with your questions and the conversation. We want to let go you ahead. know that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, we want to let everyone know that on June the 12th, Steve Hargadon will be talking with Larry Falazzo, and he's a huge blogger on all different topics and, and curators, so you'll definitely want to check that out on July the 2nd. He'll be talking with Matt Hearn on de-schooling, and there's a big unschooling movement going on um, and kind of moving schools uh, to moving students to homeschooling and having the students drive what they want to learn. But anyway, that's, you'll hear more about that. And he'll be talking with Will Richardson, with Will Richardson's new book he just released. On June the 15th, we will be talking uh, with the people from the National Writing Project and things that you can do this summer to kind of support that and participate. And that's going to be a really fantastic project. Those people that are listed there are really excellent presenters and very knowledgeable. On June the 2nd, 22nd, I'm sorry, we won't have a show. That will be um, because a lot of us will be at ISTE if you're here or in San Antonio, my hometown, or coming to San Antonio. Um, really looking forward to seeing everybody at ISTE. And then June the 29th, we will return for Infusing Tech back with um, Tia Cooper. Latia Cooper who does fantastic things with light binders and STEM. But this time she's going to be talking with about the Common Core standards. And then we're going to uh, take a few weeks off in July, but return for the August show. So we've got a lot of things and a kind of final wrap up with Tia, that's really going to be fantastic. So remember that, mark your calendars. She's fantastic. And we would love for you to nominate a featured teacher for future sessions. Anybody who works with students or colleagues, we would love for you to be uh, to nominate. You can nominate yourself as well. Um, and we accept everybody because we just want to get the word out about working with technology. The form is listed in the chat. You can click on it now. And it's on the live binder, so you can always access it.
at any time to nominate, and I put it out on Twitter every once in a while too. And once you exit today's session, a survey link will open automatically for you in your browser, and we'd love to get your feedback on today's session, as well as some topics for future sessions. And anytime you review one of the recordings, you can also use that same survey link and request a professional development certificate, as well as for today as um, today's session. Just put your name and email address, and then Peggy will send that to you in the email. And those are great. And if you can't uh, get professional hours officially, you can just post them on your wall and share it with your student, like some of our other people do. That you can, uh, that you're still uh, pursuing education and learning. We also have an iTunes U channel where you can subscribe to the video MP4s and the audio MP3 collections and take us wherever you go on any of your mobile devices. You can also use a regular RSS feed aggregator and subscribe to our blog post, just like a regular blog post, and get the resources, the recordings, and, the, and everything all in that blog post. Um, on your RS feed aggregator. And it was sad that Google Reader has gone away, but there are plenty great, fantastic ones out there. And we want to give a very special thank you to Holly today for being our featured teacher for June, and to Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of our webinar series, and Weebly for providing our website so we can post all of our information. And all of these links are in the live binder in case so you don't have to worry about jotting them all down, as well as the links that were shared today. They will be added to the live binder afterwards, um, in addition to the ones that Holly shared with us prior to the session. So you can always find the links. And the links are posted on our blog if you miss a session, so that you can go back and get the links. And we thank each of you for participating in the conversation and asking questions. And we hope that you'll stick around and continue to do that. And we want to thank Blackboard for this uh, platform to meet each week. And so I'm going to take it back to the questions slide. And if there are questions, we'd love for you to type them in the chat. In the uh, chat. And there is a live binder competition going on. And the form, I believe, um, is in the live binder. And there it is right there. You can just fill it out. It's, uh, it's very anonymous. And just put in some of your favorite live binders and why. It's a very short form. And um, nominate some that, that you've seen in the past that you use uh, or that have just been very helpful to you. We hope that you will do that and um, share that. And once you exit today, the PETSEL, uh, the survey link, there's a spot where you can put your name and email address. And then the certificate will be emailed to you. So um, that's how you get your certificate for today's session, as well as any session that you watch from our archives. You can get one for those as well. So we hope that you'll take just a second to nominate some of your live binders. It closes tonight. Um, and then people can vote on them. And um, hopefully some of our live binders will be in there. But if you have a great live binder, please share it with the competition and nominate it so that um, others will know about it as well. And I'm sure Tia's uh, STEM one is going to be nominated. Because I know I already nominated it. But I hope others will too. So. Um, Wes, there have been some questions to you if you would love to. Oh, you're on your iPad, I think, or cell phone. Um, so I'm not sure if I could get the mic to you. I, yeah, I can get you the mic, uh, I believe, if you wanted to, uh, you know, add to the conversation. And we would love for, if there's a question that we missed or we haven't addressed, we would love for you to type those in the chat or click on the hand and we'll give you the mic so that you can also participate. Um, if you're on an iPad or an uh, iPhone, I believe you still can activate your microphone. 
So go ahead and hit the button, <laughs> Wes. Hey, I'll I'll give this a shot. I'm actually on the road, so it's been uh, great. I'm like the fourth connection. So could you would you mind uh, just repeating the questions because I uh, I've, I've missed a few of those questions that have come in. Well, not necessarily a question. Just if you want to talk about iPads and uh, Google Apps, and there just been um, one of the questions was that their students have iPads. Are there less options on the iPad versus like a Chromebook? You know, I think it's a great question. I've uh, this summer I'm doing a little experiment where I'm I'm basically uh, using a Chromebook and an iPad um, and not a MacBook just to kind of see how that that productivity uh, flow works. The biggest difference that I see currently is that you know with the Chromebook it's set up for an individual login, so you are um, able to have a customized experience with your apps and you know things that you create. And so on the on the iPad, it's important to use apps like Edmodo or My Big Campus or Google Drive, so that students can you know be able to uh, you know publish their stuff and have it on in in their own login and that kind of thing. So um, the workflows that folks are doing, Ginny Ashby is one uh, Australian educator that uh, does a lot of podcasting and a lot of talking about workflows and you know how students use a different workflow with apps on the iPad in order to get them published. So I think that you know there's there's um, some challenges that the iPad presents because it's originally geared more towards an individual person rather than having it as a as a shared device um, and a lot of a lot of situations you know iPads are being shared on carts but um, anyway those are those are a few thoughts and the other thing I, I kind of toss out is it's interesting as we think about you know creating digital footprints for our kids you know at what point you know can and should those our, 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 our students our, and even our children um, you know, kind of voice what they want or don't want to do in that in that whole process. So um, I think it's exciting and there's a lot of value in that. But then I think it it also kind of poses challenges because it's not like age 18 is the age of consent for a digital footprint. Folks are doing that earlier um, when kids are even younger. So great, thanks for adding to the conversation, uh, Wes. That's really really valuable and important information to consider. The tool that you use with your students, and I think a lot of the um, activities are going to go more towards tablets, iPhones, cell phones, and I I don't think laptops are going to go away, but I think they're going to become a secondary tool. That's just my personal opinion. And Becky's asked, does anyone have a permission slip for blogging and using web tools that? Um, pass the scrutiny of a legal department, and that is one very important thing to uh, consider um, is your AUP and what your district allows and doesn't allow. And I'll find the link. But Craig Manson has, and I know there's a district here in town, Northeast ISD. They have gone to instead of what you cannot do, to what you can do with the district resources, and what you can do. Uh, with the technology resources the district has. So that's kind of a paradigm shift that somebody mentioned. But if anybody has a blogging um, or a permission form that they'd like to share, you can post the link in the chat. And uh, yes, definitely. Most of us don't use just one platform, one type of device, or one software. Um, because if you can't use uh, Google Apps, there are there's Zoho. There's a lot of different things on online that you can do. Um, Kid Blog is great because they don't mine any of the data, and you don't necessarily have that 13 age limit. Hey, is Holly Holly? Are you still on? I am. I'm, I'm hey, listening you, to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome presentation. I, you may have answered this when I was dropped a little bit, but what advice do you have for reassuring scared parents that are really, you know, freaked out about the idea of their kids having their names online? I mean, their, their, their kids may already be on both Instagram and Facebook, but still, when it comes to school, you know, parents may be reticent to say yes. So, how how do you uh, counsel 
parents with respect to student names online? Well, I, I did talk about this. I have student, I mean, parent information sessions where I kind of really talk about the importance of this. And then after I talk about it, I have them sign a permission slip. And there are still always one or two who don't um, do it. But by the time the end of the year rolls around, they've gotten such pressure from the other parents and from their kids that they always come around. So I find if I front load with reasons why and the safety that I will, um, you know, empower them with, they come around. And if you have the parent set up an account um, or and model with the, the parent right then how you would use it with students, sometimes that eases a lot of their fears and how it's protected, how you do protect it with passwords and those kinds of things so that their student isn't just exposed out on the, the internet with their name, address, phone number and everything, but you're modeling just like you would with your students, you model it for the parents and have the parents go through it just like you would with students or have their students show their parents right then and there along with you. Um, that's another way. And how do you demonstrate your parent sessions, Holly? Um, well, I don't know how I demonstrate them, but I um, I just do a 21st century, I do four sessions. I do a 21st century learning session, which I'm really just talking about where these kids are as learners and how they are growing up in a share and create um, environment. And then I do a whole social media to get them past that. And then I tell them how we start with Edmodo and we baby step them so they're ready for this environment. and. Um, then I do one, oh, I forget the two other ones off the top of my head, but they continue along the digital citizenship path. And um, by the end of the four, they're fine. And I have um, parents from as young as kindergarten willing to just put their stuff out there right away because they want it to be something that is populated by them. And I also give them the option. One, if you don't like something, I'll put it, I'll take it down right away. And, and I often will start with Vimeo because parents have this bad association with YouTube. And so if I put anything online that's going to be like a link on a um, video sharing service, I, I start with Vimeo. Oh, that's a good point. And Wes has posted a sample permission form, a link to some permission form examples that you can use um, to kind of to get permission and also to uh, let parents know that it is going to be safe and protected and you're not just going um, posting information without yeah. thinking about things and it's curated the important right of a digital of a good digital um, footprint because mm -hmm. yes and their online presence because and how to do things appropriately without bullying and those kinds of things. She uses Vimeo.com instead of YouTube. It's a similar service of where you upload the videos and um, post them and people can comment or you can moderate the comments, but um, it's another free service that you can post pictures, excuse me, post videos. Holly, have you had good luck embedding audio on Google Sites? That's something I found a little challenging, and I think Kern has talked about some widgets, but have, have you been, have you done that? I, you know, our kids aren't doing just audio, and when we put something up, we're just doing the video, the complete video, so that hasn't been a problem. Are you guys putting podcasts up and stuff like that? Oh, well, there have been some different audio recordings that kids have made, and sometimes just like when they have MacBooks, you know, just like as an MP3 on their on their laptop. Uh -huh. So um, putting them on audio, on audio boom may be a good option, or, or, you know, go into video and they just have a single picture or something like that, or narrated slideshow. But is Google Sites what you think is the best as far as your student portfolios at this point, kind of like Kern does? Yes, yeah, um, Google Sites. Uh, I go back and forth because Google Sites, as you know, is not super user friendly and I have sure. a problem with some of my teachers being able to support that. So, so I think 
I'm sort of leaning right now for the younger grades of doing Weebly and then moving into Google Sites with the middle school and then they choose at the end. But, um, you know, yeah, you know, it's not very user friendly. Kick blog right. is great for starting a portfolio um, as well as wiki. Some of the wikis can be very easy for students to use as well. Well, listen. I mean, you're the you're the one doing it so well, Les. I'm in awe. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Well, I, this was a phenomenal presentation, and I just so appreciate it. Uh, got lots of great ideas. So I've actually got to drop off uh, the call, but it was wonderful to learn with you, and I'm going to look forward to hopefully sharing this recording with a lot more teachers. And keep up the great well, work, Kim and Peggy, and everybody. Is just this is such a, such awesome learning. So really appreciate Wes, it. Wes, will you be at ISTE? Yes, yes, I will be there, and I'll get to make uh, EduBloggerCon. Finally, I've only gotten to make it one other time, so I'm pretty excited about that. So, well, hopefully, I'll we'll get to meet you. Yeah, okay. that, that sounds good. All right, great. And okay, um, it, school tube was mentioned as well as um, YouTube does have an educational channel now, and ways that you can uh, block some of the external videos that go around it to protect uh, student videos. So they are becoming definitely much more education friendly, school friendly, and student friendly. So that's something to think about and present to your parents. I know YouTube can be a bad word like you mentioned um, and a negative connotation, but it's it's all in like somebody mentioned earlier, I forgot who and I apologize, about the paradigm shift and and you know, just your approach. And if you approach that it's going to be safe and secure, um, whether you use Google what, or KidBlog or whatever, yes, definitely modeling for the students as well as modeling for the parents and emphasizing to the parents, like, if there's something that's posted they don't want, you'll take it down immediately, you know, that the parents still kind of have control and say so in what's posted and and they don't feel like they're being held captive, but they still have a way to participate. I think like you mentioned earlier, Holly, is a great way to include them in that process instead of them just being a bystander or just a spectator, but that they still have say so I think is great. How can you do the digital citizenship in 15 minutes? Right. Just, um, I'm not she, sure what DC is. I think she's asking Paula. Yeah. Which I'd like to so we're talking because Paula's scheduling um, a Google Hangout later this evening. Oh. But we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And if you have questions, okay. we encourage you to contact Holly. There's her um, Twitter information. And there are lots of Twitter chats. Den has one on on Thursday nights. Monday night, I think it's a parent one. Uh, Tuesday's Ed chat. Um, there's so many; it's hard to to keep track of. There are tons. Um, but if you just watch for different things going on, Sunday nights there's also some. There's book uh, chats. Can um, I put a shout a out for that? For I have one here in California for California educators. California Ed Chat Sundays at 8 p.m. Pacific time. <laughs> great, great. That's a great one to consider. And Paul is talking about digital citizenship. She does a 15-minute presentation. Um, you can also put them oh. on your YouTube, your blog. Parents can see those as well and learn information with their students and feel a little more comfortable as well that um, you know that you do have the safety of the students in mind. So thank you everybody for joining us today. We're going to have another great session next week um, on the National Writing Project that with uh, student voices and things. It's really going to be fantastic. Um, so again, thank you so much, and please use the form, the link in the uh, MyFinder to nominate another featured teacher, including yourself, 
Uh, Paul has been one. Kyle's been um, a presenter for us. So please do that. And the National Writing Project, if you want to check it out prior to next session, we invite you to do that as well. So have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, check out the Google Hangout. Follow Paula on uh, Twitter because she posts a lot of fantastic things there. And so I know she'll put the Google Hangout information as well. And she and a lot of the people in the session today have presented for us. So um, Paula can uh, give you some great information. So the link to